Well, good morning, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Real Estate Heavyweights. And today we have our Real Estate Heavyweight University, where we are taking a very deep dive into the world of flipping. Overall, going to be talking about real estate investing. If you're a real estate professional, if you've ever wanted to learn about investing, uh, this is your place. Uh, We're going to really take a, a really deep look into the ins and outs of investing. I'm Ashton Hines. I, uh, I'm a realtor. I'm a real estate investor. I also work a full-time W-2 job. And so I've got the dual career thing going. I'm working on my fourth flip. I've got one rental. And so I'm really early on in my journey and I'm still learning. I got a ton of questions. Luckily, I have a good friend, Tavis Westbrook, who's with us. He's flipped over 200 houses. He's got multiple midterm rentals. He's got a small commercial building. He's got a lot going on. And so, uh, Tavis, uh, how are you doing today? Let us know how you're doing. And uh, oh, let me let me do that one. So, Tavis, how are you feeling today? How are your uh, your rentals doing? How's the business doing? And then, uh, why don't you get us started into our topic today? Good morning, man. I'm doing great this morning. Um, yeah, the uh, you know all of our rentals are doing really well actually um so our midterms are fully occupied right now i've just got a a notice of extension on uh two of them yesterday so that's always exciting yeah Uh, that's one thing cool about midterms is you keep the back end open so that you can extend the existing tenant versus short term um you are really trying to keep your calendar full So therefore, you have somebody already pre-scheduled to come in when one person's moving out. So you don't do extensions. Uh, So that's one of the big differences. Now, it can curate a little bit of vacancy when that happens because you may not have anybody lined up right away. uh, And you may be vacant for a few weeks to a month. Yeah. Um, But anyways, that one's doing great. Commercial, we're wrapping up the final TI for one of the national tenants that's getting ready to to uh, get a CO and get moved in. And I think that we're about a month early on timeline. So that's, that's exciting as well. Cool. Um, I'm ready to be done spending money on that thing. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> so, yes, um, I, know, I know that feeling for sure. <laughs> you know, it, it's been a learning curve for sure, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm done writing checks on this thing every week. I, I want more checks coming in. So yes, that'll happen yes. in, in about, February will be fully uh, stabilized to where uh, everybody's rent is due and no more rent abatement at that point in time. So that'll be exciting. That's when I'll start actually feeling, um, you know, the numbers and the cash flow coming in. So that's exciting Definitely. stuff. Nice. All right. So um, we're going to jump right in. So one of the things that we've been talking about in the last couple of episodes uh, with Flipping University is uh, talking about uh, our rehab or renovation um, tiers and the cost associated with that. So this is something I put together years ago. This was a methodology that we came up with that would allow us to walk a home or even take a phone call, for instance, and get enough information where we could kind of, um, you, you know, dissect the property or kind of prescript if you will, what we were getting into and kind of do some quick math to know about where we need to buy this property before we ever left our office. Um, And so we kind of call this a tier structure. And you've heard Ashton and I talk about tier one, tier two, tier three, and we'll even mention, you know, tier four, which is basically um, the ultimate, you know, tear down, scrape, um, you know, rebuild, you know, infill lot, however you want to pronounce it. Um, but that gets into, uh, the tier four thing. So typically we're not really playing in that game too often. Um, that's kind of a unique situation. I've done it in the past. Um, but the timelines are pretty extensive. And so I've kind of pulled away from that, from that, uh, desire, but you know, Hey, the right opportunity comes up. I always, always dig into it, look into it. So, um, nevertheless, uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three, we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about how we associate dollar per foot with those numbers. Um, so getting into that, uh, Ashton, do you want to comment anything before I dive right in? 
Well, I mean, I'll say this as a new investor, you know, we talked a little, a little bit about this last week as a new investor, I would really, you know, probably, you know, uh, cheat towards the lower end, the ones and the twos, you know, my very first deal was a, an easy one. I mean, I think we, we bought that house. We are going to clean it up. We're going to uh, change out some countertops and some backsplash. I don't, we didn't even paint in that house. I mean, it was a great house. It was a unique situation, but it just really fit to learn, learn the business. And then the, the, my next one was actually, um, a full on, I would say you would call a level two where we were, we were doing all sorts of changes. We moved a few small walls. We didn't really change out any big roofing or air conditioning, but we did a little bit of foundation work and a little bit of, uh, a little bit of wall movement. So it was, it was moving up the food chain as far as, for as need. And so we talked about this last week, if you're early on, you know, listen to all these things, learn how to do them, know what you, you know, what, what to look for, but use this as kind of a filter, this knowledge that you're going to get today, use this as a filter to say, okay, yeah, he's starting to talk about stuff. I, I saw a house the other day, a wholesaler sent me, I think it would need all of this stuff. Maybe that's not for me. So that's, that's how I went about finding my first few ones. And so uh, yeah, go ahead and get into what you're looking for. Maybe we'll, let's just start with a level one. What are, what do you define as a level one? Okay. Um, and so Ashton, what, um, I'll ask you this, what was your dollar per foot that you ended up on, on the first one? Did you do that math on it? I, that would, I, I'd almost call your first one, almost a hotel. Yeah. Meaning that you bought it, you did a really light lipstick clean up and then you put it on the MLS and sold it. Right. So yeah. You well, took my very, very, some, uh, yeah, my very, very first was one convenience, was convenience. Right. Yeah, for sure. My very, very first one actually was, I, I, I went to, and I'm not kidding on this. I bought the house. I had a full budget to renovate it. This was during the height of a frenzy. I, spent five dollars at home depot to fix a little leak on the washing machine the little bib was dripping and i went to home depot got that little cap put it on there and then i actually sold it to a a larger wholesaling group and i think i netted somewhere in the realm of fifty thousand dollars on that and so nice you know that's completely unique so the next one I had, I would have to do the, I, I haven't done, I can do it real quick actually. So I, I think that was around 2,700 square feet and I spent roughly 8,500 on some cabinets and some uh, cabinets and, or uh, countertops and backsplash. And so uh, how would we do that? So 8,000, we did math last time. This didn't work out very well. When we're doing math live, this is not, this is not good. But At least you yeah. got a calculator in front of you. Yeah, I got time, a calculator. You know? So $2,800. Yeah, don't, don't, don't do. Yeah, 2,800 square feet. And we spent roughly $8,000. So. Um, yeah, so that was cheap, cheap. Super cheap. <laughs> like three dollars a square foot <laughs> so yeah i mean it's like um you know super super lipstick and unique but i guess the point is like those exist and you can wait around and try to find something yep. like that you know and would everyone love to spend five dollars to make fifty thousand sure or forty whatever it was you know um yeah i i am confident everyone would love that you can wait around for ones that are way easier you know maybe just super easy paint or carpet and you're not going to get the, maybe you won't get the top end, but it'll be easy. You can kind of learn it. Um, so yeah, I mean, early on, I mean, super, super easy. I think my third one over at Polk, I mean, we're looking way more closer to like the $50 a square foot, you know, um, I would, well, we, and we probably even went over, so maybe six, you know, you know between 50 and 60 by the time yep. we actually had to double back and do plumbing again and all that sort of thing. Gotcha. Um, uh, so yeah, um, I, I would like to say that I think we're a lot better at math at this kind of thing. Just don't give me math mixed in with dates and, and start yeah. calculating years because uh, that is definitely <laughs> not my strong suit. After yeah. 40 years old, I think we'd try to count backwards and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we don't we'll, want we'll, to think about how many years it's been, right? We'll avoid that <laughs> math again. So, all right. So let's, let's get into this. So uh, tier one, I would say, you know, back in the day, uh, and this isn't even that long ago, but I mean, about six, six years ago or so, 
I used to say tier ones would run somewhere between twenty and thirty five dollars a foot, and the average was somewhere in the, like the twenty six dollars a foot typically, like dealing with like a nineteen seventies home, for instance. Um, now that number has boosted up to where it's now realistically about thirty to forty dollars a foot. And the middle tier, the average was sitting about $35 a foot. And that's for tier one. And I'm going to dive in and tell you kind of what tier one is here in a second. Um, but tier two uh, used to be about 35 to $50 a foot. And now that number is going to be about 40 to about 65 um, is about what it's running me uh, the last several projects. And again, we get these numbers by tracking our data. So any any good businessman will look at their numbers and uh, constantly look back and track the data and the um, you know the, the the performance levels right of what we're doing and trying to make sure that we're on track. And and the more you track and understand, the more that you can do better buying in and uh, you know programming your your future and your business model to make sense. Um, and then tier three used to be somewhere between 50 and 90 a foot. Now I'm going to bump that number way up. Uh, I'm going to say that's probably between, uh, it'd be, it'd be tough to even get it done for like $75 a foot, but I would say you can run your numbers at maybe $75 a foot and go up from there to even probably about $125 a foot. And, um, you know, that's, that's tough. I haven't done one of those in a little while, but I've seen where numbers have, have ran and, um, it's very possible that the, those numbers are going to get up there. So, um, all right, so let's dive right in. So tier one, um, is basically, uh, kind of going over your structure, um, to repair only. So this is going to be roofs, foundations, any kind of framing, you know, if you want to, um, if you have any kind of issues uh, due to structure, like say you have posts out on the front porch that have failed and you need to replace those, you know, things like that. That's kind of what that's addressing. You're not really getting into opening up walls and things like that on a tier one. You're trying to stay within the walls, within the footprint, within the floor plan. And it's basically a cosmetic renovation, um, appliance package, carpentry. Uh, you're getting into minor repairs, cosmetics, countertops you're going to deal with your your low grade you know quartz you know your low grade granite that kind of thing electrical you're basically focused on bringing things to code and repairs uh, you're not doing a lot of remodel stuff flooring you're doing you know carpet and bedrooms you're doing lvt uh, you're doing tile on the bathrooms you know that kind of thing you're kind of trying to keep your your overall cost uh, efficient if you will you're not getting into you know, site finish wood floors and things like that on the tier one typically. Um, then we get into, you know, hardwares and fixtures. You're going to do your lighting, your door, you know, your door hardware, your cabinet hardware. HVAC, you're doing repairs. You're you're replacing if needed, but you're typically doing repairs. And then uh, permits only as required. So maybe if you're moving up an electrical panel to the outside, for instance, and it was in the master closet before, or maybe it's, it, it's a federal Pacific or a Zinsco, you need to change that out. You know, th those are going to be more onesie twosie type permits. You're not typically, typically going to pull a permit for a whole house remodel on a tier one. It's going to be more kind of as needed. Um, and then you get into uh, your glass, your shower doors, your mirrors. I would typically try to stick with like a frame shower door versus a frameless in this price point. Uh, landscape, you're going to do your builder type, basic package, nothing crazy. You know, painting, interior, exterior, plumbing is going to be, you know, repairs and fixtures. Uh, pool, obviously, you know, repairs uh, as needed. And, uh, you know, getting into roof again, this is repair, replace, you know, tile, you got to do as required. You might even keep some of the tile if you can. I've definitely done several tier, tier ones in the last couple of years that I've kept existing floors and I've kept some existing tile and just cleaned it up, regrouted as needed, you know, and I've, I've just disclosed that, Hey, I kept the floors and there's going to be some in, imperfections in some of these floors where there's scratches and, and things like that. Maybe it's not the best install job 
but I can get away with uh, selling the property because they look good overall. You stage it and then just disclose that those floors were existing. Um, I yeah. just did that in Irving, actually. And then, uh, you know, don't forget your cost in trash haul and cleanup. That's one of those things that people kind of consider hidden cost and, and they'll bite you <laughs> because yeah. they add up. On average, I'm spending somewhere around $1,500 uh, at a minimum on a tier one, uh, just, just with trash hauls, just the initial demo trash. And then, you know, hauling off all the cardboard boxes and all the final stuff and cleanup. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of your tier one. Um, again, looking at that number, that, that number that we're talking about is 30 to, uh, $40, right. With the average being about $35 a foot. Um, so, Quick math for you guys out there: two thousand square foot home, you're gonna start about sixty dollars or sixty thousand dollars, and that number is gonna run up to about seventy thousand um, dollars, potentially being somewhere in that sixty to seventy thousand dollar range, right? So if you're doing that math there, and a lot of people say, "Man, that's crazy," but I'll tell you, that's what's happened. So, if you buy a house and you think you're going to do it for forty thousand dollars based on the twenty four twenty dollar a foot game that we were doing six years ago, it just doesn't happen. Or you're cutting major corners, and people are going to see it. And so, uh, that's something that uh, that we're seeing quite often. Um, you know, that people are either cutting corners or you're doing it right and it's costing you money. Now keep in mind the numbers are going to be higher on the smaller square footage as well. So if people get into like a thousand square foot home or a 1500 square foot home and they're like, you know, great, this thing's only going to cost me $30,000, you know? Uh, and you know, the reality is kitchens are kitchens and bathrooms are bathrooms. So it doesn't really matter the size of the square footage. You're going to save money on flooring you're going to save money on paint. You're going to save money on, you know, some fixtures and things like that because the house is smaller. But at the end of the day, you're still spending the same money on appliances, roughly the same money on countertops, the same money on tile. You know, things like that aren't going to change much um, in a in a smaller footprint. So typically in a 1,000 to 1,500 square foot home, that number is going to be on the higher side, closer to that 35 to 40, $40 a foot right now. Uh, versus that that lower side, um, so that's just something to keep keep in mind. Ashton, what what do you have? Uh, what do you, do you have anything to say before we jump into tier two? Well, what I would say is um, one thing that Brandon Turner of Bigger Pockets. I remember him doing a short a uh, while back, and this really hit home for me. Um, is that every dollar matters? And it's really easy to get into these projects where you're talking about sixty, seventy thousand dollars, and you know I I fall into the trap of hey it's okay wh who cares it's an extra hundred and fifty dollars to to pay for this tile or to pay for a guy to come out and do it twice or whatever, and one hundred and fifty here and there starts slipping away, and over the course of a project it really really does add up. That being said is sometimes spending a little bit more to get someone to come out and do it quickly actually saves you money because you're paying a lot of on the hard, let's say you're doing hard money. So I think knowing what you're wanting to do, having a decent idea of your design, what level of things you're wanting to do, this also gets to having a really consistent look. I know you're good about this. You use similar paint colors, similar tile and similar quartz and all, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every house because that costs time. And honestly, it's not as efficient. You're ordering a new material. Maybe it's not the right quality. You have to send it back. It doesn't look very good. So if you can kind of land on a, a certain look for a while and you know for a fact that this hardware is good, this plumbing is good, everyone, all your trades have worked with that specific tile, that specific valve for the, the tub or whatever, and they're not having to relearn. They can work faster. All of that adds up and you're going to save thousands of dollars over the course of a project. And if you think about if you want to do this professionally and you're scaling and you're doing four, five, ten houses a year or more. But, you know, on my level, I would love to get to where I'm doing ten houses a year. And if you're talking about just two thousand to four thousand dollars a project, which is easy to let slip away or to save. Well, now you're multiplying that out on the year. That's 40 grand. 
that you're putting in your pocket just by being efficient and making some of these seemingly simple decisions in the moment. So that's kind of what I learned going from my very first big project where I was just learning everything and haphazardly picking things. So now where I, I see how you do it and you're really, really consistent about materials. I, I see how that can be super valuable. So that's what I would say when you're looking at all these tier one, tier two, whatever, find something that works for you and be okay with sticking with it for a few projects. Cause it really will pay off. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Austin, um, Ashton, sorry. <laughs> um, I was in, or my son was in Austin this past weekend. Anyways, uh, I think that was a great, a great point uh, to dive into, kind of figuring out your guidelines and sticking to it, right? And and repeating um, the same thing over and over. Uh, you might change a few things up depending on the house, right? I, I architecturally, if the home's a little different, I might change something up a little bit. Backsplash is something I usually get a little bit more creative on, depending on each house. Um, but for the most part, I kind of know my numbers. I know the price point of the materials I'm using and try to stay within within a realm that's pretty consistent so my numbers can stay consistent. I will back up a little bit, and there's probably some listeners out here that think we're nuts uh, talking about, you know, the numbers, uh, you know, for a Tier 1 house, uh, you know, if I say cosmetic only, and so people are probably – challenging that thinking, Hey, how's that $60,000 for a 2000 square foot home? Um, I'll back it up and I'll, I'll say this in this market right now that we're dealing with, it's rare that if a home only needs cosmetics and it doesn't have any, uh, foundation problems and it doesn't have a bad roof and it doesn't have a bad AC system. It's rare that we're going to actually have that opportunity where the seller says, Hey, I'm truly in a convenience position here. I just want you to take this house off my hands and um, and I don't have any other options, right? It, it, that's very rare. So I will say that based on my numbers over the last couple of years, the majority of the tier ones I've done came with one item, at least one item that was, that was driving my cost up, right? It, and so it, whether it was a bad roof and I had to replace a roof, there's 10 grand. So now you're dealing with $50,000 to do the remainder of the project, right? Because 10 grand was eaten by the roof or it needed a fence. Um, you know, there's eight to 10 grand right there. Uh, or it had foundation problems. Okay. So foundation problems, you're somewhere between 5000 to $15,000 sometimes. And then, you know, do you have a plumbing issue uh, beyond that, right? So there's you or... You know, the windows are completely trash and you got to spend five grand on windows. Um, so those are different things that I want to mention in here that um, even though I'd consider it a tier one and I'm using like existing flooring and some of the existing tile that's in the home, you know, I, I went ahead and replaced the windows or I replaced the roof or I installed a fence. So that the, one of those big ticket items is, is included in that overall number. So just so you guys are aware of that, it's been rare that I've come across a tier one project the last couple of years where it didn't have any big ticket items at all. Right. So, uh, anyways, I just want to bring that point up yeah. uh, for anybody that was, uh, thinking that I was crazy, uh, throwing those numbers out there. Um, so diving into tier two is going to be everything you did in tier one, but what bumps it up in a tier two is now getting into some bigger things. So for instance, um, Austin's la uh, Ashton's last two projects, um, the, you know, the house needed to be opened up. The floor plan was choppy. It was super dated. It needed custom cabinets. You know, he was, he replaced the windows on both projects. Um, he actually, uh, did some surgery, uh, in adding a bathroom on this last project in Mapleton because it had the master bath before was considered like a Jack and Jill bath with the guest. So the guest bath was shared. And, um, you know, in order to maximize that value, we needed to change that um, architectural detail. And his last project on Polk, um, did you merge a bathroom or what did you do on Polk? Because I know that uh, the master suite was down. But yeah. was it two bedrooms you merged into one and just made a big master suite with a big closet? Is that what you did over there? Yeah, on um, Polk, we actually 
so we took a wall, a pretty good sized wall out of the living room, the front living room and the kitchen, opened that all up. We also uh, finished out closing in the back room so we could add it in the uh, square footage back there. We sheetrocked, we put air back into a, a uh, back room, kind of a sunroom that was there. Uh, and then we actually brought the master bedroom downstairs. It was upstairs, really small bathroom, really small closet. We converted an old, old school den in the back of the house and we partitioned that off. We used the one little bitty bedroom that was downstairs that didn't have a, anything plumbing attached to it, just a little bitty bedroom. We actually made that the master closet and then the den became the master bedroom and part of that we partitioned off and we made the master bathroom. So all new plumbing over there. Luckily it was pier and beam and so plumbing was easy to move around, electrical, all that was easy to move around. But yeah, we, we brought a bedroom downstairs, added a full new bathroom downstairs, and we moved the laundry room actually from the center of the house towards the, the, uh, the garage. You know, so it, it had several elements that you're talking about, adding square footage, moving a bedroom downstairs, moving plumbing. You know, it, it was fairly complicated as far as the, the spacing, but it made it feel like a much, much newer, more modern layout. For sure. So tier two, I would consider, you know, we're basically staying inside the outside walls, but you're upgrading and uh, changing the floor plan around and uh, updating. Um, you know, you're going to update electrical, you're going to update plumbing, you're doing window replacements, uh, you, you know, structural now is including some framing work, you know, inside, maybe some exterior walls, maybe you're having to close up some windows maybe move some windows around, you know, those are all different things that are going to happen in the tier, uh, tier two, um, electrical, you're going to modify, or you're going to rewire the whole thing. Uh, flooring, you might upgrade now to wood floors. Um, you know, something you're doing in Mapleton, it had existing wood floors, but you went ahead and continued that theme throughout added floors where they needed to match. So that way you have hardwoods throughout the entire home now. Um, you know, HVAC, you're, you might upgrade the ductwork now, um, which is a, a really cost effective thing to do. Um, as long as you don't get taken advantage of like Ashton did, um, on this last project, but <laughs> yeah. up to upgrading the ductwork can actually be very cost, uh, cost effective. And what I mean by that is a lot of these seventies homes had the return ducts, um, inside of the two by four wall cavity, and you'll see the the old returns, um, kind of a rectangle return and different bedrooms and living rooms, et cetera. So if you can find an area in the hallway or something where you can put a 18-inch uh, duck return, you know, in and, and centralize that location um, or balance the system and you have kind of a, a couple different, uh, you know, return ducts, the, the system will operate much better. It'll be cleaner on your wall space. You won't have a bunch of ugly grills around everywhere. So that's something that you can easily do. It usually doesn't break the bank. And um, and then you're getting into permits. You know, now you might actually be turning in for architectural uh, city and energy permits with the city. Uh, painting, you're, again, now you're getting into more sheetrock work where the last tier one, typically you're just patching cracks. You're doing some minor stuff. Now you might get into more of a turnkey sheetrock and texture work. Plumbing, you're getting into modification, replacements. You know, you might be moving toilets around. Uh, and this may be, you know, my <laughs> one of my worst things that I hate dealing, dealing with now, especially like in these 70s homes in Plano, is uh, replacing sewer lines, right? Yeah. So dealing with old cast iron pipes and um, having to tunnel under the home and, and, and replace the pipes to uh, yeah. PVC. This is... About two out of three homes right now that I'm dealing with in Plano, I'm coming up against this. So it automatically takes my tier one budget into a tier two budget um, just with that fact alone. And like this house I did two doors down for me, it was disappointing because I didn't really do a lot of modifications to the floor plan. I mean, the house pretty much stayed what it was, but because I had to get into plumbing, then I had to actually do cabinet work, which I originally was trying to keep cabinets. So Unfortunately, it kind of pushed me into a tier two uh, category just because of the plumbing itself. Um, yeah. So wow. that's one of those things to consider. And, and, and I'm running into that. I'm getting outbid quite a bit in Plano. Um, 
because people aren't considering that. But I much rather prepare for it than not be prepared because you're talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars it is for plumbing, and then if you didn't count for cabinets, then you got another ten, twelve thousand uh, dollar bill on top of that, right? Right. Um, so that can kill your margins. I mean, if you're buying this thing and thinking you're going to make $40,000 and then all of a sudden you're spending $40,000 between plumbing and cabinets, you're toast, man. Yeah. It's done. Right. Um, and then you're priced too high and then you're chasing the market, which we, we see that, uh, right now. All right. So then getting into tier threes. Um, uh, so tier threes is, um, basically, and tier threes is when we're talking about expansion uh, or adding square footage to the property to make the numbers make sense. And we'll see this quite a bit from wholesalers and just different people, especially when you get into Dallas. I mean, right now, most of the time when I'm getting a lead in Dallas, I'm kind of cringing because I know I'm dealing with a 1940s house or a 50s house or 60s house um, or the numbers start so high that I'm getting a, li- a lead that's like buy it at 500,000 and it can be worth 850, you know? And I'm like, okay, well that's great, but what's it going to cost me to do this renovation? Mm -hmm. Right. And am I adding square footage? And as we talked earlier, you know, this number is going to start at like $65 a foot and go up to 120, you know, potentially it just kind of depends on how crazy you get and how far you got to peel this onion back to make it work. Um, but, you know, tier three, you're getting into structural, uh, definitely you're doing permits. You're, you know, you're doing full, full set of plans on this thing. You're doing outside the wall additions. So that's really what makes it a tier three is you're going outside the walls. Now you might be ch- changing the elevation of the home. You you're adding on, um, you know, you might even be converting a garage, but then you're adding a second, you know, a, a second garage, if you will, or a mm-hmm. detached garage. Um, you're getting into extensive framing, um, you countertops, you know, you're going to do some custom stuff in there. You're going to, you know, want to dress this thing up. Cause now tier three, you're typically dealing with a million dollar plus home right now. I used to say that tier three would, would start at like, you know, six fifty, seven hundred, 700 and go up from there. But in, in this day and age and the, in the price points that we're dealing with these days, this is going to be something that's going to result in about a million dollar property um, from that point. Unless you get into something that's just like a thousand square feet and you're going, Hey, I need to get this thing to 2000 square feet and it's somewhere in old East Dallas or something like that, where you can make the numbers work and sell it, you know, in the fives or the sixes and you can buy this thing is, you know, cheap in the twos or something. But, um, you know, again, that's getting really, really difficult to, uh, to find and, and do, um, HVAC, you know, if you're getting into tier three, man, replace the whole system, you know, don't jack around with trying to keep an old system. Um, we did that years ago and it bit us in the butt, you know, yeah, I mean, we spent over $250,000 of renovations, but we tried to keep, you know, parts of the old HVAC system because they were proven out. And it was just one of those things that we just ended up, uh, having to negotiate at the tail end. And even though we were right and they were wrong, it was just the, the stigma that right. basically we were giving them a new house and, and we didn't upgrade that. So just plan on it. Um, you know, plumbing, you better change all the plumbing out. <laughs> you getting into that, just plan on replacing all the plumbing. I don't care if it tests good or not. And, um, you know, permits are typically going to require engineering work at that point. So you're probably going to spend money on an engineer as well. And then landscaping, you might get into more extensive stuff with flat work, irrigation, um, you know, site grading, custom design stuff, you know, things like that. So it's going to get a lot more, you know, custom builder type of type of thing, right? Um, you see this a lot in, in old homes, used to see it a lot down in like Bishop arts district and things like that, where people were restoring these old homes. Um, you know, those are definitely all in that tier three kind of structure. Some of the projects I've done before, one of my most famous projects was, was, uh, a mid-century home built in 1963 on Custer Parkway in Richardson. 
we won a bunch of awards. Uh, we got a Preservation Dallas Award on it. Um, that renovation cost $625,000. Wow. Um, it was about an 18-month pro- project. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, keep in mind, four, four to five months on that project was just design before mm-hmm. we ever swung a hammer. So, um, you know, keep in mind, that's, that's also what eats up your timeline sometimes. It's not even just the project itself. It's the design. It's the permit phase. It's getting through the city. You know, you can turn in plans and wait six weeks to get your plans back. So that's where you just have to be very aware. If you're going to take on a project like that, you better have the timeline accounted for. And you better, if you're doing hard money or you're doing any kind of private money where somebody's expecting money back in six months, it's not going to work. You're going to have to make sure that you have a long enough timeline on your, on your money for a project of that, of that magnitude. So just something to be aware of guys. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can see why, you know, you kind of want to build into that and you want to, you know, make mistakes on a lower level project where you're, you know, if you overrun like I did at Polk, you're overrunning by an extra twenty to $30,000 because you had to double back on a few extra things. If you do that on a bigger project and you make a mistake or, you know, you don't finish it out to the proper level, you're having to discount, you know, Forty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars off of a project. If you know, if you're starting out and your your list price is one point two million, well, uh, you know, a percentage drop off of that is significant if it sits on the market. So, this goes back to, and it all works together. You know, this goes back to knowing before you even put a bid in on a house to do, knowing what is the realistic number you can sell it for, knowing who is actually buying this house, what are they expecting as far as amenities. The farther up the food chain you go. The more custom you want, you know, the more unique, you know, and designer things are expected to be. You there's certain levels of of countertops and tile. You can't just go find whatever's on sale at floor and decor and make it work. Whereas if you're doing a smaller uh, project and you're going to maybe use it for a rental, you could probably start there. You know, you could go and find the stuff that's on sale and you can work your design around that. On the other side, you have a vision and you have a customer that you're backing into the materials. And so you have to really know what you're getting into and you have to spend time in those stores. You have to spend time pricing things out to just know what things are going for and what things are selling for um, at the moment. So, yeah, those are all uh, you know great tips. I hope at some point I get into those. You know, the nice thing is, is I would think that if you can train yourself and become comfortable with doing some of those larger renovations, you're, you're weeding out at least some of your competition as far as other investors. And so if you can sharpen your pencil and make really good bids and know your, your process, you could probably get into some deals that could net some really good money. Um, the, the, obviously higher risk, higher reward. You don't want to jump into that immediately, but, um, I'm hoping at some point I can do something along those lines and, you know, do something that's, I, the the fun factor to me is is elevated a little bit in those because you do get to sort of express a little bit more of the artistic side and I I like that you know some people this their number guys I don't really care what it looks like I just want it to make money I get that I I enjoy the design part and so the idea of getting to go in and do some fun stuff and you know change around some walls and layout and you know get to design a really nice bathroom or a kitchen and know that the budget will uh, absorb that I think would be a lot of fun so. Uh, hopefully at some point I get to do that. So, um, well, why don't we, uh, start to wrap it up a little bit? Do you have anything else to say as far as the tiers, um, or how someone should go about, you know, is there, is there any sort of good software? Do you, do you recommend people just basically trying to find a mentor that's done it in that space? How do you, how do you recommend someone getting this knowledge of uh, today, what would something cost in their market? Let's say they're not in Dallas. How would you go about knowing, you know, what you should be spending on some of these things? So I think, you know, it's, it's important again, uh, we go back to building your team and just make sure that, um, you have your team, whether you're playing the role as the GC and you've got all your subs lined up and you kind of know who you're dealing with. I mean, I remember starting out, you know, 15 years ago and, you know, we didn't really have the budget to, 
work with licensed trades, right? So we had like the journeymen's and the people that didn't have master license and they'd save us money and they would do some of the work, you know, and later we learned like, okay, that's biting us in the butt or they can't pull a permit or whatever the case may be. And so we had to graduate to spend more money on bigger, you know, on licensed trades and people that I don't have to babysit, right? People that are going to do it right and get these green tags. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's like my electricians and my plumbers and, and, and HVAC guys and things like that, where I just, you have to give a healthier budget as much as it stings and it hurts sometimes, especially like on a simple tier one, like, you know, that little Irving property I just did cost me $3,000 in electrical. Like really, you know, I mean, we did some things on the front end and, and we trimmed it out on the backside, but I overpaid, I mean, for what we did, but mm-hmm. they did it right. They cleaned it up. I didn't have to babysit them. They knocked it out fast. And I know that they will come back if if I get into a problem or something got flagged on an inspection, that they'll come back and fix it, right? Yeah. So that a lot of times is worth its weight in gold, even though it stings or I didn't necessarily prepare with the right budget with it. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. But, you know, we didn't get into tier four, too much and that's your scrape and your rebuild and that's because that number is really variable based on where you're building and what your you know what your price point is going to be what you're going to sell that property for um and and most people don't get into that right that that gets into the builder territory and you better know what you're doing or you better make sure that one of your people on your team has experience building and knows what they're doing and if that if it's a custom build for instance they have that experience and you check their references and they've done this, you know, a handful of times and they know their numbers. Um, you know, we had enough information to be dangerous to dive off into it and we still made money. But, you know, when I look back at it, like our first one, I want to say first build job, we might've made $60,000, right? Mm. Um, it wasn't anything super exciting, you know, <laughs> Um, but we, we started it, we, we paid to learn, if you will, and we still made some money. And then, you know, we repeated the second one pretty much identical. Um, we changed some elevations up, but everything else kind of set and it got a little easier and we made more money cause we were able to sell it more cause we were able to use the first comp to bump our numbers up. Right. And so the second one, you, you know, I think we made over a hundred thousand dollars, right. Um, and then getting into the third one, I think we made, you know, like 150 plus. Right. Um, but it also was, was the acquisition number. Like the, the one we made the most money on is because we bought it at the courthouse steps and we were competing against people that wanted to buy it as a rental, uh, as a 800 square foot home. And our whole intent was to buy this 800 square foot home and tear it down and build another one. So we didn't have any competition at that time. So we were able to win there because we were looking outside the box uh, compared to our competition. And, you know, that was one of our best home runs. Um, But, you know, it didn't take long after we're doing these builds and we're pushing these price points that competition started rolling in and started doing the same thing. Hmm. And now if you go to that area, that was Little Forest Hills. If you go to that area, you you can't buy a new build in there now, you know, less than a million dollars. And they're they're big homes now right because they had to increase the square footage to make the numbers make sense and so that's another thing when you get into building you have to work your numbers backwards you have to find those comps it's the same thing as flipping or any other methodology we just have to look at what those comps are and work the numbers back and see what we have to buy the dirt for if you will and what's happened is the dirt has gotten so expensive now that you're having to build a bigger home in order to make the dollar per foot make sense. And that, again, it goes back to our last conversations about dollar per foot. And you have people looking at it and going, there's no way I'm paying $500 a foot for this house, right? So they have to make the home bigger to make it $300 a foot. And then mm-hmm. somebody's like, oh, okay, I'll pay 300 a foot, right? Right. And so that's the that's the crazy part about it. But then you end up with a house with 2,000, 3,000 square foot wasted <laughs> just right. because a, you're a playing a numbers game. A big game room game. upstairs, yeah. Um, a big game room upstairs and a huge, 
huge master bedroom that you're oddly spaced with, <laughs> you know, you have three sitting areas and yeah, yeah, those houses feel weird. You have super wide hallways. The scale does feel odd when you go into a house that's just kind of square footage for the sake of being square footage. You can really tell when you're walking. Yeah. Through. And keep in mind, these, these are, these were not big lots. I mean, the average lot in little forest Hills is 50 by, a, by one fifty lot. Mm. You know, I mean, it's not big, right? That means that you're building a house that's a maximum of 40 feet wide to have five foot setbacks on the sides. And, you know, we were fortunate enough to build some one stories that made sense to meet the demographic, but now you can't do that and get the square footage out of it. So they have to build up. So again, yeah, they just kind of end up being funky floor plans and oversized mm -hmm. homes that, mm -hmm. you know, everyone makes fun of and is like, Hey, these are big mansions being built. It's because the numbers have to make sense. And, and yeah. that's what, you know, the general public and people don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, it's all really, really good information. This is where years of experience, you just can't replace it. I mean, I bless you if you're trying to get started. I'm getting started. I'm two years in. I'm still making mistakes. I'm finally making my process a little bit more efficient. I know there's other people out there that get started. They do 10 their first year. They just figure it out. They get a team. They, they're really efficient. Everyone has their own journey, but I guarantee whether you're speeding up your, your time frame and, you know, your first couple mistakes or within, a, you know, the first six months you're doing yours and then you take off and you're doing 10 or 20 in that first year. Or if you're like me and, and you're slow playing a little bit more and you're doing one at a time, you know, trying to learn, like you're going to learn these lessons. And so, you know, find your team, find people that can help you out, go connect with the local real estate, you know, community there, you know, the Facebook groups, the meetups, Find people that are actually out there doing work. Um, I know with my relationship with Tavis, you know, I came into it with basically saying, um, I, I don't have any more money to buy any houses right now, but if you need any help with anything, if you need someone to run by a project, if you, you know, what can I do to sort of add value to you? And that's kind of how we hit it off. And you know, he's never really taken me up on me going over, I, I think there was a couple of times I had, you were out of town, I ran an errand over to a house and unlocked something or checked to see if a vendor had been by there. You know, it's not like all of a sudden I saved you 50 grand, but if you can find someone doing work in your area and you can add some sort of value to them, maybe you're out just trying to find them new houses. I guarantee that they're going to teach you these little tips and tricks and you will, you know, I made a, one of my very first short videos early on, Tava saved me several thousand dollars on a demo bid. Just, and I didn't know any different. He just, you know, just in the matter of him talking to another investor, I, I realized I was about to overpay for demo and I avoided that. So just being around people that are doing that business will greatly, greatly benefit you and your growth and, and your ability to do these projects. So um, we will be back at you later this week, Friday, hopefully with a, uh, another edition of our sort of our pop culture news, real estate world, uh, uh, you know, trying to dive in to see, see what's happening in DFW and across the United States with real estate. Uh, we come to you once a week with these deep dives, the, the Real Estate Heavyweight University. You can check me out uh, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, all, the, all the socials, uh, Dallas Real Estate Guy. And uh, please connect with me and like and subscribe this video if you're checking it out on YouTube. Follow us on Spotify, Apple. Send it to a friend. It really, really does mean a lot to us if you can spread the word. So, Tavis, let everybody know how they can find you. Yeah, so Tavis, like Travis, with no R. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. Please don't hesitate to reach out and see how we can do business together. Definitely. All right. You guys have a great day, and we will check you back later this week.